When I first started working on the problem of trying to create a photoreal digital human, it was in the late 1990s, and we actually didn't know if it was ever going to be possible. It's still possible at that point to imagine that there was something magical or ethereal or even spiritual about just the way that a human face looks that somehow technology would never be able to simulate. Now we can do something that we didn't even know was going to be possible before. Here at the Institute for Creative Technologies, our focus is really on the next generation of virtual reality. We think of our mission in some ways to try to create new technologies that'll get us further toward the Star Trek holodeck, which is this room that you walk into and it's the perfect ultimate virtual environment where the walls fade away and suddenly you're somewhere else talking to digital characters interactively. We keep reaching limits with digital culture and thinking um, and thinking it's over, we've gone as far as we can. Virtual reality and now digital humans creating these visual experiences really does show some promise as like a whole brave new world for inspiring creativity and new dimensions of digital experience. Right now I'm inside LightStage X. It's a computer controlled lighting system that we use to digitize human faces at the highest resolution possible. It's like you're getting an orgone box or something like that and being bombarded with cosmic rays. They're able to capture all your expressions, 360 degrees, all the follicles of your hair and everything. And so it can basically duplicate you. So human faces are really difficult. First of all, because we have so much experience looking at human faces in our daily lives. There's special mechanisms in the brain just designed to recognize people and to try to pick up very subtle details of how somebody is moving their face as a cue to what they're thinking and all the forms of nonverbal communication that's there. So if you get anything off, you could very easily uh, pick it up as a cue that something's wrong inside this person that you're looking at. One way to think about this is the, the famous concept of the uncanny valley, which was uh, originally applied to uh, robots that are trying to look more and more like humans. Something that looks a lot like a human, but it's got something wrong with it that maybe you just can't quite put your finger on, can actually be a lot creepier than a cartoon character that isn't even trying to be fully human. One famous example was the Christmas movie Polar Express. The motion of the faces and how they mapped the low resolution motion capture data onto these digital characters, general consensus was that the characters look a little bit dead or a little bit creepy, and that's not good for a Christmas film. The company Image Metrics approached us uh, in 2008 about, hey, do you want to try to create one of the first photoreal digital actors. That became the Digital Emily Project. We suggested, well, how about we scan the actor not just in a neutral pose, let's actually scan the face in every facial expression that we could imagine for this actor. So they cast Emily O'Brien, who at the time was on a soap opera called uh, Young and the Restless, and in March of 2008, we scanned her in about 30 different facial expressions. We processed all of this data down to the level of skin pores, fine creases, 4K texture maps, and delivered it to image metrics, where they went and rigged all of these different facial shapes into an animated character. And the result is at least convincing enough that when we showed the final thing to Emily, she just said, that's great, that's just video of me, right? Well, I think that they have a long way to go. There's always kind of an arms race where technology goes a step beyond seemingly our capacity, but then we also learn to outsmart it. And the same thing has to happen when you're confronted with a digital human. At first, you feel this like kind of terrified sense of submission to the spectacle. You know, like, oh, now I have to accept this thing as human and it's triggering all my emotions. And I feel like a sense of vulnerability. Then I begin to know, I learn, through my non-artificial intelligence to keep up with it. So we've actually come a long way since Digital Emily. And if you compare Digital Ira to Digital Emily, we're now doing the whole head and we can render this in real time. Every single frame of the Emily animation took over a half hour to render. With Digital Ira, this runs in a game engine 
and it can actually generate these at 30 frames per second. So going from 30 minutes per render to 30 renderings per second is orders of magnitude speed up. Certainly the most important part of a digital character is the eyes. And by this I don't mean just physically the eyeball itself, but the whole area of the skin around the eyes. There's all these little muscles here that can kind of twitch and, and squish. And there's so much information just in this little area that is the most closely associated with what's going on in the brain. The computer graphics rendering techniques for digital iris eyes are incredibly advanced. The translucency of the skin around the eye, the fact that the front surface, the cornea of the eye is smooth, whereas the sclera, the white of the eye, is a little bit bumpy. All of those things are being simulated as faithfully as possible. In the world of acting, if you're acting on the stage, you're acting with your body. If you're on television, then you're acting with your face. And if you're in movies, then you're acting with your eyes. That's where so much of the information is conveyed. I ordered a yogurt parfait, and the whole parfait was fruit. Frozen fruit. There is no yogurt. It's supposed to be half fruit and half yogurt. But the whole thing is frozen fruit. It could be a little bit strange because they would do the capture and then I would walk by the offices of, of, of the team and they say, hey, you should see what we're doing with digital art. And at some point, you know, it, it felt a little bit too personal where they almost have a voodoo doll that they're sort of manipulating and doing things without my knowledge. So I, I suggested to Paul that he reverse the letters of my name and call it Digital Ira and create some kind of distance between me and my doppelganger. years ago, I went to Sundance to see um, a piece of interactive journalism called Hunger in Los Angeles. No, you're blocking the... You should be in line where your number is. You put on the headset and instantly you were walking among people in a kind of soup line and one of them, I think, went into a diabetic coma. It was a beautiful and incredibly engaging spectacle. And first, I was hit with nausea and that sense of dislocation when I put it on. I wanted to send a signal to myself that I wasn't buying it. And I thought that might be a way to get my equilibrium back. So one of the things I wanted to do was do things that I can't do in normal space. You go up to someone that's not real, there are no consequences. You just want to like do shit that you can't do to people. I sort of put my hand through a hologram and then just pushed this guy, I remember. You know, nothing happened, but I had a sense of just like, see what's like not real about this world. The idea for the ICT came about from the U.S. Army being interested in essentially a flight simulator for social skills. The ability to interact with a virtual character in a way that will train you to interact with real people. They had the idea that there's a lot of commonality for what is necessary in the next generation of video games and the next generation of Hollywood visual effects. Probably the biggest movie that we worked on with the light stage technology was uh, James Cameron's Avatar. And it's the first movie that we used our newer high resolution facial scanning process. Our friends at Weta Digital heard about this and in 2006 we had uh, Sam Worthington, Zoe Saldana coming over and getting their faces scanned so that there would be high resolution data available of them for the Weta digital team to build the Na'vi characters. Of course, Avatar, there's a tremendous amount of motion capture in the film. For the climactic battle, when I'm in my armored mobile platform, my amp suit, that's all done through motion capture. So in fact, the Colonel Quaritch you see in the suit is me, but it's an animated version of work that I did on a motion capture stage. Everything on Pandora is digital, the, the jungle, the, uh, the amp suit, the lighting. You know, it's a lot easier if the character in there is also a digital asset because then you have complete control over putting them in there. I complimented myself and how good I am in those scenes, which is to say I'm complimenting the animators who captured me and applied me brought me to life. You know, a lot of actors are wondering, wow, is, is this technology going to replace actors? Every digital character you've seen in, in a movie so far, or a video game, if you are believing the performance and reading some real emotion out of it, it's because there was a real actor that actually gave that performance in a performance capture system. I think that we're a very resilient uh, profession. And we've dealt with all kinds of technological change from the very beginnings. And we've always 
manage to incorporate it and use it to uh, our advantage. Much of what we do is really about pretend. I mean, it always has been. And there's no better kind of venue than the volume, which is where the motion capture happens. You get right back to the fundamentals of acting. We don't yet have good enough artificial intelligence algorithms to generate uh, all of the things that a digital actor should do with their face in order to be fully believable. Some of the work that's going on at the uh, University of Auckland with one of our former colleagues, Dr. Mark Sagar, he's trying to create a digital baby he calls Baby X. It's based on his own young daughter that is going to model what's going on in this simulation of a human brain and eventually is going to start to be able to speak and put words together. It's a kind of a radically different approach to the artificial intelligence problem. What's this? What's this? What's this? Good girl. Inception is what the word is. I think that's going to be some of the most interesting research that will happen over the next decade or two. With this kind of 3D data, you actually have the opportunity to manipulate it and make the head do things or say things or do something that wasn't actually done. So it's a little bit more um, important that you have control over it than if it was just a film. It certainly will be possible in the future to you know, pick some kind of political figure, get a good voice impersonator, tell them to read any line of dialogue you want, and uh, you know, create video of them saying something that they never said. Well, we're going to have to become comfortable with the fact that that theoretically could have been created with a computer. I mean, I've joked about it say, b b before saying, well, it'd be strange if like 30 years after I'm dead, I show up and, you know, doing porno or something. <laughs> You know, it's like any technology. It'll have its interesting uses, it'll have its terrible uses, and, and, and somewhere in between. Uh, to me, it's exciting. At this, this period in time right now, we're really moving ahead at a very fast pace, and I, I really think in the near future, we're going to see these photorealistic people. Another technology we're working on developing is for holographic-like display of human characters. And we have a, a system that allows you to render a real person that was filmed on video or a digital character in a way that it kind of feels like they're really, you know, in the room with you. It's going to be very exciting when we can create interactive versions of these characters. I can imagine having you know, an incredible experience, one of these, you know, resurrected digital humans of, you know, someone who's died. Being able to talk to, you know, my late grandmother, not because it would feel like it would trick me into thinking I was actually talking to her, but, but because I would love to see her again. And to the extent that the creators of digital humans can recognize that. This is, this is an aesthetic experience. These things will be much more successful than we ever anticipated. And it might very well change our understanding of who we are and what it does mean to be a person. Maybe it really is that you are a set of atoms that exists on this earth with an ability to produce and give and contribute in some way. And that that's going to distinguish us from any kind of computer algorithm.